Well, you'll see there on the back of your <clears throat> morning outline that I'd like to think with you this afternoon some about holy as I am holy. And we are going to end up uh, in John's gospel. God's self-revelation in the scriptures, as you know from Isaiah chapter 6, is holy, holy, holy. One writer calls this the white, hot, blazing glory of the triune God. That's very picturesque, the white, hot, blazing glory of the triune God. And as we see that depicted in Isaiah's vision there, you recognize this is who God is in and of himself without relation to any other thing. And I had introduced this to you last week, something that I came across uh, a number of years ago that um, was written by Sinclair Ferguson. The name of the book is Devoted to God. I think it's like 2002, 2003. Um, and, and he is in that book writing some things on sanctification. So that phrase, be ye holy for I am holy, would be a springboard for a study on sanctification. What does it mean to be holy? And what he does throughout that book, and I have not read the book, but throughout the book he develops, he basically exposits five or six New Testament texts of scripture uh, teaching us about sanctification. Uh, he describes it as establishing Velcro strips in your mind so that you can grapple with this, this idea of holiness unto the Lord. Uh, but in his introduction to that book, he uh, challenges us, and this was the seed thought that led me down this path into thinking about this a little more. He challenges us to think in terms of what does it mean when God says, holy, holy, holy. And he challenges us with the reality that whatever that means, it's not defined in relationship to anything else. So the standard definition of holiness is separation from, which is a good definition because that's what the word means. It means saints are separated from. And I have tried in my own mind to think this out and, and tend to move into, into a direction of making sure we start with who we're separated to. And then we can think about what we're separated from. Because I know, as you know, that there is a tendency to create our own personal definition of Christianity based upon how we define holiness. But what Sinclair does in the book is, is uh, suggest to us that whatever holiness means, it has to be defined within the Godhead. It has to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It can't be defined in relationship to anything that's created. It has to be the self-revelation of God, who he is in and of himself. Well, I think that dynamic really opens our eyes. I know it has very, it helped me to try to flesh this out in terms of how do we stay out of the ditches? And um, you know that when people say, well, this is what I think holiness is, what that does is it creates uh, kind of a standard of our own personal definition of that. And then it creates a very complicated Christianity and many times a very judgmental Christianity. My definition of holiness is boom, 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 boom. We've done it with music. We, we've done it with everything. And, and growing up in that as a young man and not being all that discerning, I remember scratching my head and thinking, you know, some of the things that I just heard in this chapel hour are so very, very complex that I, I don't even think I understand what he's talking about. And I think some of you, under, you, some of you experience the same kind of thing. Let's, let's work on a working definition of holiness, holiness under the Lord. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Instead of maybe we need to drill down deeper and try to figure out what it is that God is saying when he says, holy, 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 Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within that relationship. What can you say about that relationship that tells us this is who God is? And the suggestion that he makes, and I think supports rather, I think eight or 10 pages in the introduction is that the, the defining element of the holiness of God is his devotion to himself within the Godhead. And my mind immediately went to John 13 to 17, because I thought, I think that's what we're hearing from Jesus. I think what we're hearing from Jesus is you're hearing me, you're hearing the father, you're watching me, you're watching the father. What I'm, what I'm doing, actually the Father's doing. There was a tri, there is a triune devotion. There's a devotion within the Godhead. 
that is father to son, son to father, father to spirit, spirit to son to father. The spirit comes on the scene and Jesus explains. Now, what you're going to watch the spirit doing after I go back to the father and we'll send the spirit. The father's going to send the spirit. He uses both phrases. I'll send the spirit. The father will send the spirit. And he will glorify me. He will magnify me. He will exalt me. So what's the Holy Spirit doing? Devoted to the father, devoted to the son. Putting the father and son on display. Now, when I think about holiness, and you think about holiness, I think we really need to, to give this some thought because I think we begin to think in more our conclusions about it instead of our devotedness to the Lord. Because our devotedness to the Lord will affect how we think and how we live. But instead of handing out ideas about holiness looks like this or going down some ditch that gets us over into some kind of mechanical. And, and folks, we have, we have representation of that right here. We have right here people that have come out of those kind of backgrounds, right? It's all about the rigidity and the mechanics of this is what we do and this is what we don't do. And we're holy because of that. But you know what? A person like me and a person like you can be in the midst of doing all those things and not doing all those other things and still know that in our heart we're not holy. We still don't love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's devotion. That's what he called us to, right? So that guy wants to know what's the greatest commandment. He, well, here it is. He didn't make it up. He got it from Deuteronomy chapter 6. There it is fundamentally before God ever gives his law. He says, now here's the starting point. You've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so in, in introducing that and in trying to think that back out, I, I am trying to and trying to with you. And I've scratched stuff all over the place this week, writing things down to try to figure out a way just to grasp your attention, your attentiveness to this so that I think it will be a blessing to you and be a blessing to me. I think we'll head off some of our right, our wrong understandings. Here's the deal. There's the world. Well, be holy for I am holy. This is holy because it's not like that. Watch this. I can be more holy than you are. So you're, you're holy. You're that far from the world. Watch how far I can live from the world. Well, why don't you watch how far I can live from the world? Where's the reference point? The world. Who gets lost in all that? The holy God we're supposed to be devoted to. And if you were more holy and you were more holy, you'd be where I am. That is anything but devotion to the Lord. And so I'm backing out of this and trying to think this only because I, I want to encourage you that when you go to the word of God and you think about be holy for I am holy. When God appeared, the Lord appeared to Moses in Exodus 20, uh, 3 and verse number 2. Exodus 3, 2, the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he says in verse 5, this is holy ground. This is God present with you. This is God tabernacling with you. And then when the tabernacle, the glory of God came to that place, it was brightness. It was glory. It was unapproachable holiness. When God came to Mount Sinai, it was the brightness and glory of God. When he came to the temple, it was the brightness and glory of God. When he comes to Isaiah, when he comes to Ezekiel. And so I know and you know that there's a brightness there. There's a glory there. There's an unapproachableness there. There is, he's distinct from everything else there. There's a radiant splendor there. We begin to bring those things together. We recognize, okay, that brightness, glory, and holiness is his presence, right? It's his power. You really don't want your animals to start going up the mountain. They won't survive that. Tell the people not to climb up the mountain. His presence, his power, his self-revelation. Uh, when I was... Uh, in school years ago, I was thinking, we were thinking in these terms, a, a divine otherness, a divine otherness that really commands worship from us. This uncreated one who's revealing himself to those that are created. A consuming fire would be a biblical picture. But also there would be this compassionate friend of Abraham and this compassionate friend of, of David. And holiness designates all things and people that are devoted to the Lord. So when God said, that's, that's my altar, he said, that's a holy altar. What does that mean? That means it's devoted, 
exclusively to Jehovah. That's my priest. What does that mean? It's devoted exclusively to Jehovah. Well, how about some incense that we're going to use in our worship? That's holy incense. That means you don't make that mix for personal use. It's devoted what? Exclusively to Jehovah. The priest, the clothing, all of those, the instruments that they used in their worship. The altars, the burnt offering, that burnt offering is exclusively mine. It's holy. I want the whole thing. The whole thing will be consumed. There were days that were holy. There were feasts that were holy. And what that meant was that was dedicated and devoted to Jehovah alone. So bring it forward. If that is the truth of the Godhead, there's a devotion within the Godhead that's exclusive. And there is a devotion and a dedication in all of Israel's covenant relationship with the Lord where he says, you're a holy people and all these things are holy. What he's saying is they exclusively belong to me. They are devoted to me. They are dedicated to me. They're not to be used for anything else. And then God says, I want you to be holy. For I am holy. Now, when you allow that to be distilled down into the way you're thinking and you begin to ask yourself the question, what does God mean by that? Well, to be holy as I'm holy means he wants us to be holy like he is holy in himself as the triune God. How am I to build a life that is entirely holy is a good follow up question. Well, that would be to see myself as exclusively his. That would be to see myself as bringing him glory in all things, doing everything heartily as unto the Lord, loving him with all my heart, soul, mind, strength, enjoying him as all that I need for life and eternity exclusively. And how does that fit with our recent studies? Well, that would mean avoiding all things that rival him. So what's an idol? Anything that rivals my devotion to the Lord. Anything that rivals my dedication to the Lord. Well, I don't think you should be doing that. But that thing's amoral. That really doesn't matter. I mean, what do you mean it doesn't matter? I mean, you can't say to somebody, I don't think you ought to do that. I, in, in terms of that, that looks like you might enjoy that. Let me give you an example, guys. You can give me, give me some grace this afternoon. These guys are going to race tractors next Saturday. You're racing them or seeing how strong they can pull? Which is it? Pulling. pulling. Yeah, pulling. They're going to have a tractor pull on garden tractors. Now that gets me up in the morning, let me tell you. <laughs> it doesn't at 63, but I had a Volkswagen bug with 50s on the back that could outdo anybody in Jacksonville, Florida. Those four wheel drives would sink in the sand. I'm out there buzzing around in my little lightweight Volkswagen. Because I was carnal. Because I was idolatrous. Some of you are hesitantly shaking your head no. Right or wrong. Now tell me that because I want to go Saturday and I won't go if you say. Because I care more about what you think than anything else. Okay. Could that be. Could that take a wrong focus? Every dad here. Clark. Chad. John. Any dad of any boy who's building a lawn tractor to out pull another lawn tractor can say, hmm, you know, I'm going to get my walk behind mower and go see if I can pull something. Okay. That just a silly example. And it's silly on purpose because my soul says, I don't care. It doesn't matter. What do you mean? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't have to do with Noah's devotion to the Lord. Can it be something folks? It can be anything. It can be ice cream. It can be your pleasure. It can be your leisure. And I'm not here to support tractors that pull. Either the ones on the one side of the street or the other side of the street is going to be the big dog tractors, right? I'm not saying you shouldn't go watch them pull. I'm saying, is that really what holiness is? How are you feeling about that? Now, I'm hoping all these guys will bail out of it and not do it, right? No, I don't care. Why would I care? Because my greatest interest for Joel, Joel, and Noah, which has kind of been a sentence, you know, you don't say Joel, Joel without saying Noah, or Noah without saying Joel, Joel. <laughs> and this guy here gets right in the middle of it and creates the whole scenario. <laughs> 
So we know he's not holy. <laughs> devoted, right? Devoted to the Lord. Are you getting any idea of maybe the refreshment that will come to us? I mean, I've, I've dealt with it from I don't use birth control to I don't borrow money to I can't I can't tell you all the things that I'm listening to people. And you can't say be quiet because you're a pastor. You're supposed to listen to people. But my soul, let me tell you, saying, would you just be quiet? God doesn't care about it. I don't care about it. I'm not sure why you care about it. Why? Because they've ha they're hanging on to something as a substitute for being devoted to the Lord. Now, if I could tell you the content of John 13 to 17, what would I be talking about? I'd be talking about the latest final hours in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's he talking about? Having loved them, John 13, 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he what? What is that talking about? Is that devotion? Is that devotion to those disciples that, that the Father gave him? But he, the whole context of the way he's thinking is in the context of his devotion to the Father. Look at verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon, Simon's son, to betray him. Look at verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, what did he do? And I think that when I read that text, and I think when you read that text, you think there's got to be something good about washing feet of people that, that didn't think that somebody ought to be washing feet. There's got to be something in there that Jesus has to show us because the next thing he says is, now you've seen what I've done. I've done what I've done as an example to you. But the example that he gives to them, from my understanding of the context, and I think from your understanding of the context, it goes right past Peter's feet, right past Judas's feet, goes right back to his devotion to the Father. Jesus washed their feet because Jesus was devoted to the Father. And if you try to wash feet devoted to anything less than the Father, you're going to quit washing feet, I guarantee you. Why is he going to the cross? He's devoted to the Father. Why does he keep telling these guys things about the Holy Spirit? I'm leaving another one like me's coming. The one that comes is devoted to the Father. And the Holy Spirit that comes is so devoted to the Father that he'll be doing the same things I've been doing. He'll be encouraging you. He'll be convicting you. He'll be moving you along. He'll be reminding you that you have access to the Father. And so when he gets to the prayer in John chapter 17, all he can talk about is the glory of the Father. And he says, I'm coming back to that glory that I came from. What was that? That was a Trinitarian relationship in eternity. The eternal triune God was devoted, what? To himself. And that is so right. That would be so wrong for any of us, but that's so right for him. And Jesus says, I'm going back to that, that glory. Before he does, he says, and I have given that glory to these guys. I have put on display. I have spoken what the Father speaks, devotion to the Father. When you saw me work, that was the work the Father was doing, devotion to the Father. The coming of the Holy Spirit, he'll do what I've been doing. And what will he do in us? He will cause us to be devoted to the Father. And that dedication is life-changing. If you think in those terms instead of, well, it must be this I don't do. And you know what? There are things you won't do. And there are things you will do. But we have to be up to here with all the varieties of what that means. Right? I make my own clothes, so I don't have clothes like your clothes. Okay. Why? Why? I don't have air in my tires. Why? Does devotion to the Lord look like that? 
And I'm not taking a swipe at anybody. I've got a wide open heart to people around. I want them to get the truth and the believing. I'm, a shock. I'm, I'm thankful they understand grace and they're trusting God. And I can even appreciate the fact that they understand that be ye holy for I am holy and love not the world means what? They believe it means more than I do because I've got electricity and water and gas. And probably far more luxuries than I need. Okay? But you've got to appreciate the fact that, boy, if they can get a hold of this, and if we can get a hold of this, it's this relationship with the triune God and a full, total devotion there and a love for him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now I'm saying no. And guess what? That might be in a particular situation to a particular thing that I have to say no to Mike. Is that all right? I've already picked on the guys. I didn't mean to pick on the guys this afternoon, but I could do something, get involved in something that very easily becomes idolatrous. And what Noah's dad does and what these other dads do is what my dad did and said, enough, Mike. You can only consume this amount of money and this amount of time. And then, you know what? It's in the wrong place. Anything can be in the wrong place. Excessive debt can be in the wrong place, right? All of that can be in the wrong place. But isn't it time that we settle in, drill down and say, you know what? I think I'm looking at the landscape of my whole life and recognizing there are a variety of twists and turns there. And they didn't necessarily have to do with my devotion to the Lord. There might have been some devotion to the Lord in that. Because when you're devoted to the Lord, you want to do the right thing. When you get saved, it's like, okay, what does that mean now? There's always somebody to step up and say, I'll tell you what that means. And they're committed. And they have, they have a testimony of love for Christ. I'm not putting X's and, and squaring away anybody. I'm saying at the root of all of it has to be our devotion to the Lord. And if I can get you to read those chapters and reread those chapters and listen to what he's saying. Let me tell you, I'm going to the Father. I'm a disciple. I need to know where you're going because I want to come there. Uh, the thing is, you can't come there right now. But don't think for a minute that my devotion to the Father and my devotion to you will change when I go there because I'm going to be there building a place for you in the Father's house. Why? Because that is in eternity past what God had planned. I'm going to restore paradise and I'm going to take believing people into that paradise. And so Jesus, devoted to the Father's purposes, says, I'm going there to prepare a place for you because he's devoted to the Father. The Holy Spirit will do this, 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 and this. He'll be the spirit of truth. He'll be a comforter. He'll come alongside of you. He will help you. And he is devoted to the same glory, to the same Father that I'm devoted to. And I think when we begin to think in those terms, it reminds me of what Paul's doing all over the book of Romans and Ephesians and Galatians and other places and going, now I want to talk to you about grace. I want to talk to you about favor. I want to talk to you about who God is and how good God is. And I'm going to stop here and I'm going to go over here and I'm going to answer your questions. If you think I'm saying this, you're wrong. Grace abounds. Wonderful. So if we sin more, there'll be more grace. God will get more glory. Wrong answer. Watch him. When you're reading Romans, oh, he's, okay, now this is what you're going to think. Now this is what you're going to think. Why? Because he's trying to bring us back to somewhere at a center of understanding. We are responding to the favor of God. We are responding to the grace of God. We're responding to the goodness of God. Folks, we're responding to the devotion of God. So if I quit ministry tomorrow... You come by and there's a U-Haul truck in the front yard and you say, I wonder where he's going. And you ask Laura, where's he going? She says he quit last night. He's done. What is the issue? It's obviously you. <laughs> or is it my devotion to what God's called me to do? You threaten to abandon your marriage? Quit? Your issue is not your mate. Your issue is not your situation. Your issue is your lack of devotion to God. And you start going right down the list. 
All that God has called us to, all the things that God has put in front of us, and you begin to back that down and say, okay, quitting the ministry, quitting a marriage. That's a devotion to God issue. That's a holiness issue. Quitting any concern for right choices. Quitting a love for worship in spirit and in truth. Quitting reading God's word and prayer. Quitting giving God the first fruits or helping other people. Quitting bearing witness to God's grace. Quitting the mending of relationships. Quitting love for others, including our enemies. Quitting stewardship of time, energy, and substance. What are we talking about? We're talking about devotion to God. Period. Fundamentally. So every time we go down that path, we got one place to go. Our prayer closet. To say, God, I'm here again. I have failed to embrace and understand the devotion within the Godhead. I've failed to understand holy, holy, holy. And all of a sudden, these things start going right down a lot deeper in our soul than some list that we might disagree about. And there is no disagreement in what God's calling for. He's calling for exclusive devotion to himself. That means there's things I can't get involved with. Why? Because that would not be total devotion to him. Total loyalty and dedication. Let me ask you what you know about the Old Testament, what you know about Israel. Is that not what he was calling for? And what did he argue in his prophets? I have been faithful to you. I have been trustworthy to you. I have been devoted to you. I have done any, everything that I promised to do for you. And I will keep doing everything I've promised. Before they ever messed up, he told them, you're going to mess up. And you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to abandon you. Why? Because I'm devoted to you because you're my holy people. And so he carries them off into, into Babylon. And they deal with this captivity. And, and we're being taught about when he brought them back. Why did he bring them back? Not because they were doing better, but because he was a devoted God to the covenant promises he made. The same reason, folks, he keeps loving us. If we could get out of this ditch of how I'm doing this week or how I'm doing this day and understand, you know what? He's devoted to us because he's devoted to himself. God doesn't respond to us. He responds to himself. And if I could get that in this area of devotion, I would recognize the issue of my Christian character, my Christ likeness, my holiness of life is based upon my own integrity. And how devoted I am, despite how somebody responds to me, despite what somebody says to me. And we're back into this relationship with the Lord, aren't we? We're back into, oh, ooh. And guess what I have to do? I got to let him have his way in my heart now. I got to say, ooh, <laughs> this really isn't something about a new list. This isn't something about some new mechanics where you get 1 Corinthians 13. Will you tell me how to do all that? I can't tell you how to do that. That's the love that God pours out in your heart. And it's a love of devotion and it's kind and it's patient and it thinks no evil. And people that are sounding forth substitute holiness, they do think evil. Why? Because you aren't as holy as they're sounding out, you should be. And what happens to that? What happens to that with unbelieving people? What happens to that with believing brothers and sisters in Christ? We find ourselves so far removed from them, even if we aren't tangibly removed from them, in our mind, we're so far superior to them, they don't get it. It's in all of us, folks. It's in us. It's in our flesh. But it is more, it is more than, than I think we are wrestling with. I'm an incredibly slow reader. Okay? So you apologize. I'll apologize that I've only read through the introduction of the book. I was taught by a professor years ago. He says, you know, Mike, you'll know when a book is good when it drives you to the Bible. I took him literally... And I'm so slow at reading, I only get through the introduction of most books. And if it's good, it's driving me to the Bible, and I typically don't go back. My, love, my, wife, my, my mother loves telling people I didn't learn to read till I was in the third grade. And uh, I'm incredibly slow at reading. And so I haven't poured over this book, and I'm not pouring over the book, and I'm not necessarily recommending the book as much as I'm saying to you, I think... It's one of the best introductions I've ever 
red because it drilled down and it went, oh, oh. But I suspect if, if I ever do read through it, that when he takes those five or six New Testament passages and I may give them to you so you can think about it, so you can read them and go, oh, there it is. Because Sinclair Ferguson's a faithful student of the word. I would say that he's going to show you. See it right there in Peter? That's devotion. See it right there in Romans 12? That's devotion. I expect that he's going to prove his point. My effort this afternoon, just like my effort in a lot of things over the last few months, is to try to challenge you to be back in the Word of God and look at the Word of God afresh and look at the Word of God as a whole. What is he doing in Romans? What is he doing in Ephesians? What is Jesus doing in the final hours of those lives of those disciples? I'm saying to you, I believe he's calling them to devotion. And I think that's why the epistles don't start spelling out a bunch of pieces and parts. They're calling us to a devotion to this God. And so as Paul opens his mouth in Ephesians 1, what is he doing? He is glorying in God. He said, would you look at God? And so I pray for you and I ask you to pray for me that it's just a seed thought. But I think it's a good one. I think it's potentially a life altering one. You young couples, that are, you know, you're charting a course. You know, where, where are we going? Well, you go devoted to God. You can't go wrong. There's a lot more how-to stuff out there than that one. But I'd recommend that one because I think that is as close as I've ever heard to a very exacting definition of who God is in and of himself. Totally devoted. Let us, right? Isn't it beautiful how it starts? Let us make man in our own image. And follow it out to the book of Revelation chapter 22. And who is it? It's us, the triune God working out his purposes that include the cross, include the resurrection, include everything we're learning and studying together in the New Testament. Father, we thank you. I've come believing this afternoon, Father, that your task for me, your impression upon me was to once again put this forward and just to challenge your people. We can become very, our Christianity can be all about self-improvement. It can all be about us. It can be, I want to shine it up. I want to make it, I want to stand somewhere. I want people to know where I stand and what I believe. It seems to me when our Lord is communicating, they will know your mind because of your love, because of your devotion, not only to me, but to each other. And Father, that, that cuts right through me anything about me anything about my stand anything about my posture in this world it's all about living out life and devotion to you and i pray that as we go back to the gospels as as a people as individuals as families and we explore the life and ministry of jesus christ that we'll do so and and let it be turned let it be turned in such a way that we're looking for the testimony of this devotion. That we're listening for the testimony of this devotion. See if it is not yet something else that you will use to stir us up. To awaken us spiritually. To make it very exciting for us to take in your word. Not looking for some nuance or some way around anything. But looking for what does this have to do with my dedication, my devotion, my relationship with God, with his people, and with those who do not yet know him. And I pray that we'd learn to worship you for this, that we'd talk to you about these things. And though, Father, it would be beneficial to spend another hour and go through these chapters, I, I'm giving this to your people. I'm challenging myself with this and asking you to take the living word the books are good. The book is good. But Father, it's your living word that is actually going to cut through. It's going to discern the thoughts and intents of our hearts. And yet if we read through a different lens, maybe through a lens of thinking about what holiness means in and of itself with you, Father, Son, and Spirit, may it open up our understanding. 
grant us grace in the midst of all of these things. This should reshape the way we think about people that are ill intended toward us, who say things against us. Our devotion to you should allow us to see them, to be in context with them, and to, and to communicate the love of Christ, just as Jesus did to Peter and to Judas. We need your help. And yet we're learning in Romans that you've provided that help. The Spirit of God is living in each of us that are saved. For these young men who are in the midst of being challenged as they think about their priorities, they think about what consumes their energy, their dads, their moms are going, hold on here, slow down here. May they never view their parents as against them, but their parents as those that want for themselves and for their children this kind of devotion to the Lord. And where we as parents need to make adjustments, help us to see that and help it to be out of no pressure other than our devotion to you. Help our mates to be able to see that. Help our children to be able to see that. Help our brothers and sisters in Christ to be able to see that. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Page 37. I think all of this is 